Good morning. If you keep your Bibles open there to Hebrews chapter 12, that's where we're going to be studying from this morning. It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. We have this good opportunity to worship our God together, and now the good opportunity we have to study from His Word. If your family is a lot like mine, there are times where you lose something you need. Now, that happens certainly in my family, and I'm sure it happens in your family as well. Now, I'm not going to use Kim as an example. I'm not going to use Abby and the hundreds and hundreds of times that she has lost her AirPods in our house and in the car and in her bed and in her backpack and at school. Sometimes she loses one and not the other. I'm not going to use her as an example. But there was one time that I lost something that we'll talk about. Uh, several, uh, a little bit ago, I ordered a shirt on Amazon. And uh, the shirt came in, and I certainly wasn't ready to wear it then, but I took it upstairs to our room, and I put it on uh, my desk there in our room. And some time went by, and that shirt went somewhere. Now, I don't know who's to blame or where that shirt went, but it went someplace Because when I went to go get it and to open it up and to put it on, that shirt was gone. And again, if you, like me and like all of us, when we lose something we need, or when we don't have something we need, we will immediately look for it. And we will look all over the place for it. And I did that with that shirt. I looked all over my desk. I looked under the desk. I looked beside the desk. I pulled it away from the wall. It was pushed all the way against the wall. But I thought, well, maybe it fell down. I don't know. It was impossible. But I still pulled the desk out, looked behind. I looked all around. I looked on the bed, under the bed, in the closets. I looked in rooms that the shirt had no business being in. I looked in the pantry. I looked in the oven and the microwave. I looked everywhere for this shirt, and the shirt was gone. It just was gone. But I spent lots and lots of time and energy looking for this shirt. And of course, I employed my family to help me look for the shirt, and nobody could find the shirt. But that's what we do. When we don't have something we need, we look for it. And if we really need it, we will look hard. And we'll look a long time. Now, I want you to keep that thought in your mind. It's a part of our reality. It's a part of something that all of us have done. It's something that all of us are familiar with. I want you to keep that idea pinned in your mind as we study from Hebrews chapter 4. Because there's a point that the writer will make, Hebrews chapter 12, excuse me, 1 through 4. But there's a point that the writer will make. In these first four verses, he will bring to the forefront two things that we need. The first thing is endurance. We need endurance. We need it. And the second thing that we need is encouragement. We need it. We need endurance. We need encouragement. I want you to keep those things in your mind. Here are things that we need. And guess what the Hebrew writer tells us to do? You look for it. And so that picture, that analogy, I want us to play off of this morning. We need endurance. We need encouragement. We are told to look for it. Let's read verses 1 through 4 again. I want you to be looking for that analogy. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning of verse 1. Therefore we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with race or run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross 
despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now, I want you to be looking for what we had just talked about. What's the writer want? He doesn't want you to be weary. He wants you to have endurance. And he doesn't want you to be discouraged. He wants you to be encouraged. And in order for those two things to happen, we have to look for them. But what God does for us here is he tells us where to look. The very outset of this are three different places that we are told in this passage to look for these things. And that's where we're going to spend our time. And the first is this. You look back to the faithful. Did you see what he said in Hebrews chapter 12, the very beginning of this? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, we we are on the very heels. Yeah, it is a new chapter, chapter 12. But we are on the very heels of a chapter that we are familiar with, right? Hebrews chapter 11, where over and over and over, one after the other, after the other, after the other, these men and women who exhibited incredible faith, they, incur- they endured, they were encouraged, they were victors, they were winners. And the Hebrew writer says, I want you to look back. I want you to look back and learn from them. You think about them. You focus on them. They are witnesses for you. Now, we see that word, and I don't want you to be thinking about that they are spectators, like they are hovering over us watching, but they are speaking for us. They are helping us in a lot of ways like God did for them. You you can go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and see the same phraseology used over and over again. Look at chapter 11 and verse 2. We can see really 1 and 2. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen for. By it, the elders obtained, uh, obtained a good testimony or witness. Look at verses 4 and 5. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Verse 5. By faith, Enoch uh, was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Even at the very end of this chapter, verse 39, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. The point that's being made is these men and women, they are there for us to lean on, to learn from, to look to. Now, there's a passage that you're probably familiar with in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, a passage that oftentimes we'll go to in talking about the validity of the Old Testament, the necessity of the Old Testament, the importance of it, the reason and, and why it can help us. But again, for our study this morning, maybe you'll take notice of something different. In Hebrews chapter 15 and verse 4, Paul, in writing to the brethren in Rome, says this, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That's a part of the verse that we lean on the most. But listen to the end of that. That we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. That sounds like a lot to me, endurance and encouragement. That we have these stories, we have these men and women that we can look to, that we can learn from, that can help us, that can bring us patience, that can bring us comfort, that can bring us endurance, that can bring us encouragement. These are things that we need. We need patience. We need endurance. We need comfort. We need encouragement. We need those things. How do we get that? Well, we've got to look. We can look. We can look back. 
Now, there's a lot of applications that come out of that. The easiest one is I've got to be willing to open up the Holy Scriptures. I've got to be willing to see. I've got to be willing to look. I've got to be able to read. I've got to be willing to study. I've got to be willing to meditate. I've got to be willing to lean on all of the stories and all of the characters that God has given me. Because that's what he has done. I mean, this book is not intended to just be a a history book that imparts upon us facts of men and women who have lived in the past. That's what history books do. They tell us about men and women who did this and did this and said this and said this and they lived from this time and they died at this time and that's where they are and that's who they are. That's not what God's book is intending for us to do with the people that we see. Yes, they lived, and yes, they did things, and yes, they said things, and they lived and were born, and they died, and they were real. All of that is the case, but they're not given to us just so we can learn the facts of them, but they are given to us so that we can lean on and learn from them. How does that work? Listen, you're you're having problems in your family? Are you having problems getting along with family members? You're having problems getting along with brothers and sisters, with parents, with spouses. You're struggling getting along with your family and how to deal with that. You turn back to the book of Genesis and you read a little bit about Joseph and how he dealt with his family. You think the weight of your job is too much to take sometimes and you are just sulking underneath the weight of that responsibility? You're struggling with how to deal with that and how to handle that? Well, you turn to the book of Exodus and you read about how Moses dealt with his job and how he dealt with that weight and responsibility. You have enemies or people around you that are causing problems for you, constantly poking on you, nagging you, persecuting you, giving you fits and troubles. You have people in your life that often do that, and you're struggling with how to deal with that kind of pressure. Well, you turn in the page of the Old Testament, and you see and read about David and how he dealt with that. You see, God has provided something for us in all and every circumstance. So that no matter what it is that I have going, there's some place that I can go in this book for help. And I'm not speaking on hyperbole or hypotheticals. Whatever it is that you have going on in your life, this book can and will help with that. It's the power that God has. It is the power in the book that he has provided for us. And so even the Hebrews writer here in Hebrews chapter 12 is pointing back to all of the men and women that he had just written about. And he says, you look back, and we are surrounded by these great witnesses. You lean on them. What a powerful opportunity that we do. So you can go back to the pages of the Old Testament. You can go back to Hebrews chapter 11, and you can work through all of those men and women that are being talked about. And there's so much to learn and to gain to help us, to endure, to encourage us, things that we need. Now, a very quick aside, as a group here over the next several months, we're going to do some of that together. We had a theme in the very first trimester uh, where elders have decided to do something a bit different and give us a couple of different themes throughout this year. The first trimester, our theme was Soldiers of Christ, and we spent those first four months talking about that theme. The last trimester of the year, we'll have another theme that the elders will introduce for us. But here in this middle trimester, we don't necessarily have a theme that we're going to be working on together. But John and I have decided that we're going to use as a springboard Hebrews chapter 11, specifically Abraham and his life. 
And we're going to work through in various lessons and looking to Abraham and doing some of the very practical things that we're talking about here. What can we see in the life of Abraham that can help me when it comes to endurance and encouragement? I'm looking forward to that study. But back to Hebrews chapter 12, it's not just looking back to the faithful. He'll go on to say, you want endurance, you want encouragement, you have to look at yourself for that. You've got to look at yourself. Back to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, lay aside, lay aside every weight and lay aside the sin which easily ensnares and run then with endurance the race that is set before you. You need endurance, you got to lay aside weight. You need endurance, you want to run this race, you got to lay aside sin. you got to lay aside those things. And, and I do find it interesting, and I want us to be honest with ourselves, that the Hebrew writer gives us both of those things because he is talking about different things. When he says lay aside the weight, even though sin can certainly be a weight for us, he says lay aside the weight... And then lay aside the sin because that weight that you need to lay aside may not in and of itself be sinful. But yet still needs to be something you lay aside. Again, think about the analogy that's being used here by the Hebrew writer. He he wants us to picture a race. Running a race, he wants us to picture that. Every one of us could picture that. Whether we're runners or not, we could certainly picture running a race. And the picture that he wants us to understand is that if you're going to run a race, don't carry weights with you. And you're like, okay, that that makes sense. You you talk to any runner, and guess what? They're wearing the lightest clothes that they can put on. Nobody is running races in combat boots. They have the lightest shoes on their feet. Even if they exercise with a certain amount of weight, maybe on their ankles or on their arms as they run, if they're going to run a race, they remove those things. We see it all the time in sports. I'm a big sports fan. I'm a big baseball fan. It's baseball season. If you go and watch a baseball game or you see one on television, the guy who is on deck, he's the one that will be batting next. He's standing in the on-deck circle and he's practicing his swing and on his bat he has a weight. But when it is his turn to bat, he does not go up to bat with that weight still on his bat. He, He removes that. He doesn't want to be burdened by that. And so we need to be thinking about it in much the same way. What are the weights that are being talked about? Well, a weight that needs to be laid aside is anything, listen, anything that is hindering my spiritual progress. Anything that is hindering my spiritual progress, whether that thing is sinful or not, maybe it is even a good thing. But if it is hindering me spiritually, I've got to be willing to lay that thing aside. It may be a relationship. It may be a close friend of yours. And they are hindering you spiritually. You've got to be willing to lay that aside. Maybe it is a job that you are working. And that job is hindering your spirituality. You've got to be willing to lay that job aside. Maybe it is a hobby that you have. Whatever the case may be, you've got to be willing to lay that aside. Maybe as a father, it is the way that you have chosen to run your family. You have filled up your children's lives with hobbies and activities which in and of themselves are good things and help them learn and gain things in this world that are helpful. But if it is hindering your spirituality or the spirituality of your family, you need to be the kind of leader that's willing to lay some of that aside. I'm not saying those things are good or bad, but if something is in my way, In my growth, spiritually, I've got to lay that aside. And then most certainly, he includes sin. Sin absolutely is going to hold us back. It entangles us even. 
Now, I think all sin is included for sure. There's no doubt about that. All sin is included here. But I think in context, we have to say the sin of unbelief. Because by faith is used over and over and over and over again in chapter 11, painting the picture that it is faith that enables us to endure. We're struggling in our faith. That has to be something that we work on. And so if we want endurance, we want encouragement, we've got to look back to the faithful. We've got to look to ourselves. And then thirdly and finally, we have to look to Jesus. There's a great phrase that's used here in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking to him means trusting in him. The Hebrew writer here makes the point that's what Jesus did. His focus was where it needed to be. When he was on earth, he lived by faith. He is the perfect example. He endured the cross. And what was his focus? What enabled him to endure the cross? What was he looking at? He was looking at us, all of us. The joy of the salvation that comes from his sacrifice. I want you to hold your fingers in Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to pop back in the book of Psalms with me. We'll go back this way. Psalm 16 is where I am. Psalm 16, beginning in verse 8. It's an incredible messianic psalm that is given to us here. And listen to the points that are made here in Psalm 16, beginning of verse 8 to the end of the psalm. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It is this incredible psalm of joy that Peter will reference in Acts chapter 2. He'll quote directly from Psalm 16, referring to Acts chapter 2 and the fullness of that joy. And the Hebrew writer then encourages us to look to Jesus. It's the way that he lived. It is the perfect example for us in every way. And so let's think about these three things as we close. There are certain things that we need. We need endurance. Because the race that we are running is long. And it is wearisome. And it is tiring. And it is difficult. We need endurance. But not just that, we need encouragement. Because of those difficulties. Because of the troubles that this world puts in front of us. We need those things. They're available. We've got to look to them. We have to look for them. We've got to look for them in our study, number one, and the way that we study. Number two, we've got to look for them in our honesty, in our own self-examination. What it is that I need. What are my shortcomings? What are things that need to be worked on? What are things that need to be laid aside? We've got to be able to do that honestly. And we've got to be focused. Focused on Jesus. He was able to do it. We can do it. And so as we close, I want you to think about a couple things. Throughout this book, I mean the entirety of the book of Hebrews, the writer puts emphasis on future hope. Future hope. And that's what we are encouraged to do here. Looking to Jesus, his example, looking ahead by faith. Uh, The people in the chapter before in Hebrews chapter 11, that was the point that was made over and over and over again. They lived for the future. And that is what enabled them to endure. For us, focus on Jesus. I want to close with a really quick story 
uh, from Scripture, and, and it's one that I certainly think a lot about because it is so visual and it's so easy to put into your mind, and the point is so strikingly easy to grab. You're familiar with the story where Jesus' apostles were on a boat, and they were having difficulty because the seas were not calm. Jesus at this time is not with them, but he comes to them walking out on the water. And they see him, and they're afraid, certainly, who wouldn't be, right, walking out to them on the sea. They cry out to him to find out who it is, and they see that it is Jesus. And Peter, he says, if it is you, allow me to walk out to you on the water. And what does Jesus say? He says, come on. And Peter gets out of that boat by faith, believing that it was Jesus, focusing on Jesus, and walks on the water out to him. But what does the text tell us? When he loses focus on Jesus, when he's no longer looking at Jesus, but looking at the trouble, thinking about the wind, thinking about the waves, thinking about something that he is doing that he should not be able to be doing. He's no longer looking to Jesus. His faith weakens and he sinks. It is that story, that real story, that should drive us here in Hebrews chapter 12. We are surrounded by a raging storm much like the one we had last night. But we are figuratively surrounded by that in wickedness. And we can sit back and we can be thinking it's so terrible and it's so hard and it's so awful and it's so impossible. And if that is our focus, guess what? It will be impossible for you. But instead of focusing on all that, Let's focus on Jesus, who in spite of all of the storm, we can walk easily straight through it. And that is the point that the Hebrew writer is saying. Can we run this race? Absolutely. Can we run it with endurance? Absolutely we can. Can we be encouraged as we run? Absolutely we can. But if we're going to find those things, we must look in the right places. It's an incredible study given to us here in Hebrews chapter 12, leaning on Hebrews chapter 11 with a powerful message, focus on Jesus. Well, I appreciate you listening so well this morning. We've got a good crowd of folks with us this morning, a beautiful opportunity that God has provided us here to be together, to worship Him, to praise Him as we have done, to remember His sacrifice, to think about our relationship with Him. And that's what this opportunity affords us. Tim is going to lead us in a song of encouragement, and it gives us the opportunity to do just that, to think about our relationship with God. And your relationship with God may not be where it needs to be. Maybe there is a weight in your life that is hindering your relationship with him. I'm going to encourage you this morning to lay that weight aside. Maybe there is sin in your life that you are entangled in. And that's affecting, of course, your relationship with God. I'm going to encourage you, if you're a Christian, to confess that, repent of that, as God will be faithful and forgiving you. Or maybe that sin needs to be washed away in the waters of baptism, beginning that relationship that you desperately need with God. If we can help in any of those ways this morning, let us know as we stand and sing.